Chapters one and two of the Grand Babylon Hotel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Grand Babylon Hotel by Arnold Bennett. A Fantasia on Modern Themes. Chapter one. The Millionaire and the Waiter. Yes, sir. Jules, the celebrated head waiter of the Grand Babylon was bending formally towards the alert, middle-aged man who had just entered the smoking-room and dropped into a basket-chair in the corner by the conservatory. It was 7.45 on a particularly sultry June night, and dinner was about to be served at the Grand Babylon. Men of all sizes, ages, and nationalities, but every one alike arrayed in faultless evening dress, were dotted about the large, dim apartment. A faint odour of flowers came from the conservatory, and the tinkle of a fountain. The waiters, commanded by Jules, moved softly across the thick oriental rugs, balancing their trays with the dexterity of jugglers, and receiving and executing orders with that air of profound importance of which only really first-class waiters have the secret. The atmosphere was an atmosphere of serenity and repose, characteristic of the Grand Babylon. It seemed impossible that anything could occur to mar the peaceful, aristocratic monotony of existence in that perfectly managed establishment. Yet on that night was to happen the mightiest upheaval that the Grand Babylon had ever known. "'Yes, sir,' repeated Jules, and this time there was a shade of august disapproval in his voice. It was not usual for him to have to address a customer twice. "'Oh!' said the alert middle-aged man, looking up at length. Beautifully ignorant of the identity of the great Jules, he allowed his grey eyes to twinkle as he caught sight of the expression on the waiter's face. "'Bring me an angel kiss.' "'Pardon, sir?' "'Bring me an angel kiss, and be good enough to lose no time.' "'If it's an American drink, I fear we don't keep it, sir.' The voice of Jules fell icily distinct, and several men glanced round uneasily, as if to deprecate the slightest disturbance of their calm. The appearance of the person to whom Jules was speaking, however, reassured them somewhat, for he had all the look of that expert, the travelled Englishman, who can differentiate between one hotel and another by instinct, and who knows at once where he may make a fuss with propriety, and where it is advisable to behave exactly as at the club. The Grand Babylon was a hotel in whose smoking-room one behaved as though one was at one's club. "'I didn't suppose you did keep it, but you can mix it, I guess, even in this hotel.' "'This isn't an American hotel, sir.' The calculated insolence of the words was cleverly masked beneath an accent of humble submission. The alert middle-aged man sat up straight and gazed placidly at Jules, who was pulling his famous red side whiskers. "'Get a liqueur glass,' he said, half curtly and half with good-humoured tolerance. "'Pour into it equal quantities of maraschino, cream, and crown de menthe. Don't stir it. Don't shake it. Bring it to me. And, I say, tell the bartender—' "'Bartender, sir?' "'Tell the bartender to make a note of the recipe, as I shall probably want an angel kiss every evening before dinner, so long as this weather lasts.' "'I will send the drink to you, sir.' said Jules distantly. That was his parting shot, by which he indicated that he was not as other waiters are, and that any person who treated him with disrespect did so at his own peril. A few minutes later, while the alert middle-aged man was tasting the angel kiss, Jules sat in conclave with Miss Spencer, who had charge of the bureau of the Grand Babylon. This bureau was a fairly large chamber, with two sliding-glass partitions which overlooked the entrance hall and the smoking-room. Only a small portion of the clerical work of the great hotel was performed there. The place served chiefly as the lair of Miss Spencer, who was as well known and as important as Jules himself. Most modern hotels have a mail clerk to superintend the bureau, but the Grand Babylon went its own way. Miss Spencer had been bureau clerk almost since the Grand Babylon had first raised its massive chimneys to heaven, and she remained in her place, despite the vagaries of other hotels. Always admirably dressed in plain black silk, with a small diamond brooch, immaculate wristbands, and frizzled yellow hair, she looked now just as she had looked an indefinite number of years ago. Her age, none knew it, save herself and perhaps one other, and none cared. 
the gracious and alluring contours of her figure were irreproachable, and in the evenings she was a useful ornament of which any hotel might be innocently proud. Her knowledge of Bradshaw, of steamship services, and the programmes of theatres and music halls was unrivalled. Yet she never travelled, she never went to a theatre or a music hall. She seemed to spend the whole of her life in that official lair of hers, imparting information to guests, telephoning to the various departments, or engaged in intimate conversations with her special friends on the staff, as at present. "'Who's number 107?' Jules asked this black-robed lady. Miss Spencer examined her ledgers. "'Mr. Theodore Rexel, New York.' "'I thought he must be a New Yorker,' said Jules, after a brief, significant pause. "'But he talks as good English as you or me. Says he wants an angel kiss. Maraschino and cream, if you please, every night. I'll see he doesn't stop here too long.' Miss Spencer smiled grimly in response. The notion of referring to Theodore Rexel as a New Yorker appealed to her sense of humour, a sense in which she was not entirely deficient. She knew, of course, and she knew that Jules knew, that this Theodore Rexel must be the unique and only Theodore Rexel, the third richest man in the United States, and therefore probably in the world. Nevertheless, she arranged herself at once on the side of Jules. Just as there was only one Rexel, so there was only one Jules, and Miss Spencer instinctively shared the latter's indignation at the spectacle of any person whatsoever, millionaire or emperor, presuming to demand an angel kiss, that unrespectable concoction of maraschino and cream, within the precincts of the Grand Babylon. In the world of hotels it was currently stated that, next to the proprietor, there were three gods at the Grand Babylon, Jules, the head-waiter, Miss Spencer, and, most powerful of all, Rocco, the renowned chef who earned two thousand a year and had a chalet on the lake of Lucerne. All the great hotels in Northumberland Avenue and on the Thames Embankment had tried to get Rocco away from the Grand Babylon, but without success. Rocco was well aware that even he could rise no higher than the Met Hotel of the Grand Babylon, which, though it never advertised itself and didn't belong to a limited company, stood an easy first among the hotels of Europe, first in expensiveness, first in exclusiveness, first in that mysterious quality known as style. Situated on the embankment, the Grand Babylon, despite its noble proportions, was somewhat dwarfed by several colossal neighbours. It had but 350 rooms, whereas there are two hotels within a quarter of a mile with 600 and 400 rooms respectively. On the other hand, the Grand Babylon was the only hotel in London with a genuine separate entrance for royal visitors constantly in use. The Grand Babylon counted that day wasted in which it did not entertain, at the lowest, a German prince or the Maharaja of some Indian state. When Felix Babylon, after whom, and not with any reference to London's nickname, the hotel was christened, when Felix Babylon founded the hotel in 1869, he had set himself to cater for royalty and that was the secret of his triumphant eminence. The son of a rich Swiss hotel proprietor and financier, he had contrived to establish a connection with the officials of several European courts, and he had not spared money in that respect. Sundry kings and not a few princesses called him Felix, and spoke familiarly of the hotel as Felix's, and Felix had found that this was very good for trade. The Grand Babylon was managed accordingly. The note of its policy was discretion always discretion, and quietude, simplicity, remoteness. The place was like a palace incognito. There was no gold sign over the roof, not even an explanatory word at the entrance. You walked down a small side street off the Strand, you saw a plain brown building in front of you, with two mahogany swing doors, and an official behind each. The doors opened noiselessly. You entered. You were in Felix's. If you meant to be a guest, you, or your courier, gave your card to Miss Spencer. Upon no consideration did you ask for the tariff. It was not good form to mention prices at the Grand Babylon. The prices were enormous, but you never mentioned them. At the conclusion of your stay a bill was presented, brief and void of dry details, and you paid it without a word. You met with a stately civility, that was all. No one had originally asked you to come. No one expressed the hope that you would come again. The Grand Babylon was far above such manoeuvres. It defied competition by ignoring it, 
and consequently was nearly always full during the season. If there was one thing more than another that annoyed the Grand Babylon, put its back up, so to speak, it was to be compared with, or to be mistaken for, an American hotel. The Grand Babylon was resolutely opposed to American methods of eating, drinking, and lodging, but especially American methods of drinking. The resentment of Jules, on being requested to supply Mr. Theodore Rexall with an angel kiss, will therefore be appreciated. "'Anybody with Mr. Theodore Rexall?' asked Jules, continuing his conversation with Miss Spencer. He put a scornful stress on every syllable of the guest's name. "'Miss Rexall. She is in number 111.' Jules paused, and stroked his left whisker as it lay on his gleaming white collar. "'She's where?' he queried, with a peculiar emphasis. "'Number 111. I couldn't help it. There was no other room with a bathroom and dressing-room on that floor.' Miss Spencer's voice had an appealing tone of excuse. "'Why didn't you tell Mr. Theodore Rexall and Miss Rexall that we were unable to accommodate them?' because Babs was within hearing. Only three people in the wide world ever dreamt of applying to Mr. Felix Babylon the playful but mean abbreviation Babs. Those three were Jules, Miss Spencer, and Rocco. Jules had invented it. No one but he would have had either the wit or the audacity to do so. "'You'd better see that Miss Rexall changes her room to-night,' Jules said after another pause. "'Leave it to me. I'll fix it.' Au revoir. It's three minutes to eight. I shall take charge of the dining-room myself to-night. And Jules departed, rubbing his fine white hands slowly and meditatively. It was a trick of his to rub his hands with a strange roundabout motion, and the action denoted that some unusual excitement was in the air. At eight o'clock precisely, dinner was served in the immense salle manger, that chaste yet splendid apartment of white and gold. At a small table near one of the windows a young lady sat alone. Her frocks said Paris, but her face unmistakably said New York. It was a self-possessed and bewitching face, the face of a woman thoroughly accustomed to doing exactly what she liked, when she liked, how she liked, the face of a woman who had taught hundreds of gilded young men the true art of fetching and carrying, and who, by twenty years or so of parental spoiling, had come to regard herself as the feminine equivalent of the Tsar of all the Russias. Such women are only made in America, and they only come to their full bloom in Europe, which they imagine to be a continent created by Providence for their diversion. The young lady by the window glanced disapprovingly at the menu card. Then she looked round the dining-room, and, while admiring the diners, decided that the room itself was rather small and plain. Then she gazed through the open window, and told herself that, though the Thames by twilight was passable enough, it was by no means level with the Hudson, on whose shores her father had a hundred thousand dollar country cottage. Then she returned to the menu, and with a pursing of lovely lips said that there appeared to be nothing to eat. "'Sorry to keep you waiting, Nella. It was Mr. Rexall, the intrepid millionaire who had dared to order an angel kiss in the smoke-room of the Grand Babylon. Nella, her proper name was Helen, smiled at her parent cautiously, reserving to herself the right to scold if she should feel so inclined. "'You always are late, father,' she said. "'Only on holiday,' he added. "'What's there to eat?' "'Nothing.' "'Then let's have it. I'm hungry. I'm never so hungry as when I'm being seriously idle.' "'Consommé Britannia,' she began to read out from the menu. "'Saumon d'Ecosse, sauce guinoise, aspic d'omar oh heavens who wants these horrid messes on a night like this but nella this is the best cooking in europe he protested say father she said with seeming irrelevance had you forgotten it's my birthday to-morrow have i ever forgotten your birthday o oh, most costly daughter on the whole you've been a most satisfactory dad she answered sweetly and to reward you I'll be content this year with the cheapest birthday treat you ever gave me. Only I'll have it to-night. Well, he said, with the long-suffering patience, the readiness for any surprise of a parent whom Nella had thoroughly trained, what is it? It's this. 
Let's have a fillet at steak and a bottle of bars for dinner tonight. It will be simply exquisite. I shall love it. But, my dear Nella, he exclaimed, steak and beer at Felix's. It's impossible. Moreover, young women still under twenty-three cannot be permitted to drink bars. I said steak and bars, and as for being twenty-three, I shall be going in twenty-four to-morrow. Miss Rexall set her small white teeth. There was a gentle cough. Jules stood over them. It must have been out of a pure spirit of adventure that he had selected this table for his own services. Usually, Jules did not personally wait at dinner. He merely hovered observant, like a captain on the bridge during the mate's watch. Regular frequenters of the hotel felt themselves honoured when Jules attached himself to their tables. Theodore Rexall hesitated one second, and then issued the order with a fine air of carelessness. Fill it at stake for two and a bottle of bars. It was the bravest act of Theodore Rexall's life, and yet, at more than one previous crisis, a high courage had not been lacking to him. "'It's not in the menu, sir,' said Jules, the imperturbable. "'Never mind. Get it. We want it.' "'Very good, sir.' Jules walked to the service door, and, merely affecting to look behind, came immediately back again. "'Mr. Rocco's compliments, sir, and he regrets to be unable to serve steak and bars to-night, sir.' "'Mr. Rocco?' questioned Rexall lightly. "'Mr. Rocco,' repeated Jules with firmness. "'And who is Mr. Rocco?' "'Mr. Rocco is our chef, sir.' Jules had the expression of a man who was asked to explain who Shakespeare was. The two men looked at each other. It seemed incredible that Theodore Rexall, the ineffable Rexall, who owned a thousand miles of railway, several towns, and sixty votes in Congress, should be defied by a waiter, or even by a whole hotel. Yet so it was. When Europe's feet back is against the wall, not a regiment of millionaires can turn its flank. Jules had the calm expression of a strong man sure of victory. His face said, "'You beat me once, but not this time, my New York friend.' As for Nella, knowing her father, she foresaw interesting events, and waited confidently for the steak. She did not feel hungry, and she could afford to wait. "'Excuse me a moment, Nella,' said Theodore Rexall quietly. "'I shall be back in about two seconds.' And he strode out of the salle à manger. No one in the room recognized the millionaire, for he was unknown to London, this being his first visit to Europe for over twenty years. Had anyone done so, and caught the expression on his face, that man might have trembled for an explosion which should have blown the entire Grand Babylon into the Thames. Jules retired strategically to a corner. He had fired. It was the antagonist's turn. A long and varied experience had taught Jules that a guest who embarks on the subjugation of a waiter is almost always lost. The waiter has so many advantages in such a contest. CHAPTER Two. How Mr. Rexall obtained his dinner. Nevertheless, there are men with a confirmed habit of getting their own way, even as guests in an exclusive hotel, and Theodore Rexall had long since fallen into that useful practice, except when his only daughter Helen, motherless but high-spirited girl, chose to think that his way crossed hers, in which case Theodore capitulated and fell back. But when Theodore and his daughter happened to be going one and the same road, and that was pretty often, then heaven alone might help any obstacle that was so ill-advised as to stand in their path. Jules, great and observant man though he was, had not noticed the terrible projecting chins of both father and daughter, otherwise it is possible he would have reconsidered the question of the steak and bars. Theodore Rexall went direct to the entrance hall of the hotel, and entered Miss Spencer's sanctum. "'I want to see Mr. Babylon,' he said, "'without the delay of an instant.' Miss Spencer leisurely raised her flaxen head. "'I am afraid,' she began the usual formula. It was part of her daily duty to discourage guests who desired to see Mr. Babylon. "'No, no,' said Rexall quickly. "'I don't want any I'm afraids. This is business. If you had been the ordinary hotel clerk, I should have slipped you a couple of sovereigns into your hand, and the thing would have been done. As you are not, as you are obviously above bribes—' I merely say to you, I must see Mr. Babylon at once, on an affair of the utmost urgency. My name is Rexall, Theodore Rexall. "'Of New York?' questioned a voice at the door, 
with a slight foreign accent. The millionaire turned sharply and saw a rather short, French-looking man with a bald head, a grey beard, a long and perfectly built frock coat, eyeglasses attached to a minute silver chain, and blue eyes that seemed to have the transparent innocence of a maid's. "'There is only one,' said Theodore Rexall succinctly. "'You wish to see me?' the newcomer suggested. "'You are Mr. Felix Babylon?' The man bowed. "'At this moment I wish to see you more than anyone else in the world,' said Rexall. "'I am consumed and burned up with a desire to see you, Mr. Babylon. I only want a few minutes' quiet chat. I fancy I can settle my business in that time.' With a gesture, Mr. Babylon invited the millionaire down a side corridor, at the end of which was Mr. Babylon's private room, a miracle of Louis Quinze's furniture and tapestry. Like most unmarried men with large incomes, Mr. Babylon had tastes of a highly expensive sort. The landlord and his guest sat down opposite each other. Theodore Rexall had met with the usual millionaire's luck in this adventure, for Mr. Babylon made a practice of not allowing himself to be interviewed by his guests however distinguished, however wealthy, however pertinacious. If he had not chanced to enter Miss Spencer's office at that precise moment, and if he had not been impressed in a somewhat peculiar way by the physiognomy of the millionaire, not all Mr. Rexall's American energy and ingenuity would have availed for a confabulation with the owner of the Grand Babylon Hotel that night. Theodore Rexall, however, was ignorant that a mere accident had served him. He took all the credit to himself. I read in the New York papers some months ago, Theodore started, without even a clearing of the throat, that this hotel of yours, Mr. Babylon, was to be sold to a limited company, but it appears that the sale was not carried out. It was not, answered Mr. Babylon frankly, and the reason was that the middleman between the proposed company and myself wished to make a large secret profit, and I declined to be a party to such a profit. They were formed. I was firm, and so the affair came to nothing. The agreed price was satisfactory. Quite. May I ask what the price was? Are you a buyer, Mr. Rexall? Are you a seller, Mr. Babylon? I am, said Babylon, on terms. The price was four hundred thousand pounds, including the leasehold and goodwill. But I sell only on the condition that the buyer does not transfer the property to a limited company at a higher figure. "'I will put one question to you, Mr. Babylon,' said the millionaire. "'What have your profits averaged during the last four years?' Thirty-four thousand pounds per annum.' "'I buy,' said Theodore Rexall, smiling contentedly, "'and we will, if you please, exchange contract letters on the spot.' "'You come quickly to a resolution, Mr. Rexall. But perhaps you have been considering this question for a long time. On the contrary, Rexall looked at his watch. I have been considering it for six minutes. Felix Babylon bowed, as one thoroughly accustomed to eccentricity of wealth. The beauty of being well known, Rexall continued, is that you needn't trouble about preliminary explanations. You, Mr. Babylon, probably know all about me. I know a good deal about you. We can take each other for granted, without reference. Really, it is as simple to buy an hotel or a railroad as it is to buy a watch, provided one is equal to the transaction. Precisely, agreed Mr. Babylon, smiling. Shall we draw up the little informal contract? There are details to be thought of, but it occurs to me that you cannot have dined yet, and might prefer to deal with minor questions after dinner. I have not dined, said the millionaire, with emphasis, and in that connection will you do me a favour? Will you send for Mr. Rocco? You wish to see him, naturally. I do, said the millionaire, and added, about my dinner. Rocco is a great man, murmured Mr. Babylon, as he touched the bell, ignoring the last words. My compliments to Mr. Rocco, he said to the page who answered his summons, and if it is quite convenient, I should be glad to see him here for a moment. What do you give, Rocco? Rexel inquired. Two thousand a year, and the treatment of an ambassador. I shall give him the treatment of an ambassador, and three thousand. You will be wise, said Felix Babylon. At that moment Rocco came into the room, very softly, a man of forty, 
thin, with long, thin hands, and an inordinately long, brown, silky moustache. "'Rocco,' said Felix Babylon, "'let me introduce Mr. Theodore Rexel of New York.' "'Shan't,' said Rocco, bowing. "'The... the... what you call it, millionaire.' "'Exactly,' Rexel put in, and continued quickly. "'Mr. Rocco, I wish to acquaint you, before any other person, with the fact that I have purchased the Grand Babylon Hotel. If you think well to afford me the privilege of retaining your services, I shall be happy to offer you a remuneration of three thousand a year. Three, you said? Three. Shan't. And now, Mr. Rocco, will you oblige me very much by ordering a plain beefsteak and a bottle of bars to be served by Jules? I particularly desire Jules, at table number seventeen in the dining room in ten minutes from now, and will you do me the honour of lunching with me to-morrow? Mr. Rocco gasped, bowed, muttered something in French, and departed. Five minutes later, the buyer and seller of the Grand Babylon Hotel had each signed a curt document, scribbled out on the hotel note-paper. Felix Babylon asked no questions, and it was this heroic absence of curiosity, of surprise, on his part, that more than anything else impressed Theodore Rexel. How many hotel proprietors in the world, Rexel asked himself, would have let that beefsteak and bars go by without a word of comment? "'From what date do you wish the purchase to take effect?' asked Babylon. "'Oh,' said Rexel lightly, "'it doesn't matter. Shall we say from to-night?' "'As you will. I have long wished to retire, and now that the moment has come, and so dramatically, I am ready. I shall return to Switzerland.' One cannot spend much money there, but it is my native land. I shall be the richest man in Switzerland. He smiled with a kind of sad amusement. "'I suppose you're fairly well off,' said Rexel, in that easy, familiar style of his, as though the idea had just occurred to him. "'Besides what I shall receive from you, I have half a million invested.' "'Then you will be nearly a millionaire.' Felix Babylon nodded. "'I congratulate you, my dear sir.' said Rexel, in the tone of a judge addressing a newly admitted barrister. Nine hundred thousand pounds, expressed in francs, will sound very nice in Switzerland. Of course, to you, Mr. Rexel, such a sum would be poverty. Now, if one might guess at your own wealth? Felix Babylon was imitating the other's freedom. I do not know to five millions or so what I am worth, said Rexel, with sincerity, his tone indicating that he would have been glad to give the information if it were in his power. "'You have had anxieties, Mr. Rexel?' "'Still have them. I am now a holiday-making in London with my daughter in order to get rid of them for a time.' "'Is the purchase of hotels your notion of relaxation, then?' Rexel shrugged his shoulders. "'It is a change from railroads,' he laughed. "'Ah, my friend, you little know what you have bought.' "'Oh, yes, I do,' returned Rexel. "'I have bought just the first hotel in the world.' "'That is true, that is true,' Babylon admitted, gazing meditatively at the antique Persian carpet. "'There is nothing anywhere like my hotel. But you will regret the purchase, Mr. Rexel. It is no business of mine, of course, but I cannot help repeating that you will regret the purchase.' "'I never regret.' "'And you will begin very soon, perhaps to-night.' Why do you say that? Because the Grand Babylon is the Grand Babylon. You think because you control a railroad, or an ironworks, or a line of steamers, therefore you can control anything. But no, not the Grand Babylon. There is something about the Grand Babylon. He threw up his hands. Servants rob you, of course. Of course. I suppose I lose a hundred pounds a week in that way. But it is not that I mean. It is the guests. The guests are too, too distinguished. The great ambassadors, the great financiers, the great nobles, all the men that move the world, put up under my roof. London is the centre of everything, and my hotel, your hotel, is the centre of London. Once I had a king and a dowager empress staying here at the same time. Imagine that. A great honour, Mr. Babylon. But wherein lies the difficulty? "'Mr. Rexel,' was the grim reply, "'what has become of your shrewdness? 
that shrewdness which had made your fortune so immense that even you cannot calculate it do you not perceive that the roof which habitually shelters all the force all the authority of the world must necessarily also shelter nameless and numberless plotters schemers evil-doers and workers of mischief the thing is as clear as day and as dark as night mr rexall i never know by whom i am surrounded i never know what is going forward only sometimes i get hints glimpses of strange acts and strange secrets you mentioned my servants they are almost all good servants skilled competent but what are they besides for anything i know my fourth sub-chef may be an agent of some european government for anything i know my invaluable miss spencer may be in the pay of a court dressmaker or a frankfurt banker even rocco may be someone else in addition to rocco that makes it all the more interesting remarked theodore rexel what a long time you've been father said nella when he returned to table number seventeen in the salle manger only twenty minutes my dove but you said two seconds there is a difference well you see i had to wait for the steak to cook did you have much trouble in getting my birthday treat no trouble but it didn't come quite as cheap as you said what do you mean father only that i've bought the entire hotel but don't split father you always were a delicious parent shall you give me the hotel for a birthday present no i shall run it as an amusement by the way who's that chair for he noticed that a third cover had been laid at the table that is for a friend of mine who came in about five minutes ago of course i told him he must share our steak he'll be here in a moment may i respectfully inquire his name dimmock christian name reginald profession english companion to prince arabat of posen i met him when i was in st petersburg with cousin hetty last fall oh here he is mr dimmock this is my dear father he has succeeded with the steak theodore rexall found himself confronted by a very young man with deep black eyes and a fresh boyish expression they began to talk jules approached with the steak rexall tried to catch the waiter's eye but could not the dinner proceeded oh father cried nella what a lot of mustard you've taken have i he said and then he happened to glance into a mirror on his left hand between two windows he saw the reflection of jules who stood behind his chair and he saw jules give a slow significant ominous wink to mr dimmock christian name reginald he examined his mustard in silence he thought that perhaps he had helped himself rather plenteously to mustard End of chapter 1 and 2